We are at the James Garfield home in Mentor, Ohio. We're going to take a tour and see the museum and learn all about President James Garfield. James Abram Garfield was born November 19, 1831 and died September 19, 1881. He was the 20th President of the United States, serving from March to September 1881. Garfield was shot by an assassin four months into his presidency and died two months later. He is the only sitting member of the United States House of Representatives to be elected into the presidency. The James Garfield Home and Museum is a National Historic Site and we were able to use our senior National Park passes for entry. They have a small store in the visitor center that has the typical items such as books, stickers, oh, paper doll books for girls, some shirts, and even magnets. And that's the magnet I got, the one with the presidents on it. The office of President of the United States and will, to the best of my ability, preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution. Fellow citizens, we stand today upon an eminence which overlooks a hundred years of national life. The supreme pride of the Constitution, the Union, emerged from the blood and fire of that conflict purified and made stronger. The elevation of the Negro race from slavery to the full rights of citizenship is the most important political change we have known. James Garfield was quite the radical Republican talking against slavery in his time. James Garfield was the youngest of five children born November 15, 1831 in a log cabin in Orange Township, now Moreland Hills, Ohio. Orange Township had been in the Western Reserve until 1800, and like many who settled there, Garfield's ancestors were from New England. His ancestor, Edward Garfield, immigrated from England. After graduating from Williams College, Garfield studied law and became an attorney before entering politics as a Republican. In the years leading up to the Civil War, Garfield's thinking changed profoundly as he grappled with the great moral and political issue of the day, slavery. Into a stump speech by Mr. Jeb Patterson of Kansas Territory, who has had his life threatened for publishing his sentiments in reference to slavery and the election outrages in that territory. Ah, uh, yes. The newspaper editor from Missouri, whose press was thrown into the Missouri River by pro-slavery elements there. I see in him the, the power of Western oratory and, and Western force of character. I've been instructed tonight on the political condition of our country, and from this time forward I shall hope to learn more about it. I feel as though a great unified effort should be made, and that effort should have but one aim the suppression of slavery in every newly acquired territory. You take the same position, then, as the newly formed Republican Party. But once I even doubted that a man could vote and remain a Christian. At such hours as this, I feel like throwing the whole current of my life into the work of opposing this giant evil. I don't know, but the religion of Christ demands such action. And yet I believe your brethren and the disciples movement are not entirely opposed to that peculiar institution, as some call slavery. True. 
And that is one reason I chose Williams College instead of the Disciple School in Western Virginia. Bethany College is too pro-slavery in its views. Slavery has had its day, or at any rate, it's fast having it. Garfield opposed Confederate secession, served as a major general in the Union Army during the American Civil War, and fought in the battles of Middle Creek, Shiloh, and Chickamauga. He was first elected to Congress in 1862 to represent Ohio's 19th district. Throughout Garfield's congressional service after the war, he firmly supported the gold standard and gained a reputation as a skilled orator. He initially agreed with radical Republican views on Reconstruction, but later favored a moderate approach to civil rights enforcement for free men. Republican National Convention, delegates chose Garfield, who had not sought the White House as a compromise president nominee on the 36th ballot. On July 2, 1881, Charles Duteau, 1841 to 82, fired two shots at Garfield while the president was en route to a Williams College reunion. As Garfield fell to the ground, Duteau explained, I am a stalwart and author is president now. Duteau was later convicted of Garfield's murder and executed by hanging. The whole mass of the people had been admitted to his bedside. In these long hours of pain and mortal peril, they have learned anew how great his soul their great ruler possesses. They are praying for me. Yes, the people of the entire country are praying for me. nothing. It's essentially a fence line. However, in Garfield's own time, this was actually a dirt path connecting his home to a train station that was built explicitly for the 1880 presidential election. You see, Garfield had purchased this home in 1876, five years before his death, and it was here that he had successfully run for president of the United States. Now there's some caveats to this, which are a little different than what we kind of imagine to be a presidential campaign today, where people would go out around the country, do bus tours, hold big events, shake hands, kiss babies, etc., etc. No, in Garfield's time, no one ran for president in that same way. In fact, it was considered somewhat of a popular demagoguery to go and ask the common person like you or me for their vote. No, instead, what Garfield did was pretty uncommon for his era. And you'll see this as we get towards the front porch. 
17,000 people would come by to visit James Garfield over the course of his six month presidential campaign. And these people would come from as close as down the road in Cleveland, Ohio, and as far away as California. So you can imagine the people would come down this long path here, as the farm did at one point consist of over 160 acres, until they got to the front yard, which we will get down to here momentarily. Now, about the house as we're continuing to go here. So like I said, Garfield bought this house in 1876. When he bought it, it was a small, nine-room, rinky-dink farmhouse. Uh, he had purchased this with some money he would received from legal fees during his time as a lawyer. And in doing so, he had been able to add another 11 rooms onto this home, which you'll see today. And then after his death, his wife Lucretia will outlive him by 37 years, which is a long time to be a widow for anybody. But she'll add another nine rooms on, creating the 29-room Victorian estate you will see today. Uh, the house itself has gone through multiple different colors. In Garfield's time, it was actually mostly a white color. However, Lucretia did enjoy changing the colors and designs of the house. We've left it kind of this, depending on who you ask, it's a blue-gray or a purple. I'm colorblind, so bear with me here, folks. <laughs> so we're going to walk up a little further here. And the first thing you're going to see is this small house, the campaign office today uh, and after we finish our tour you're welcome to go inside and check it out you see originally it was actually just a space where Garfield kept a couple of his tenant farmers it was a bunk house but you got to understand the Garfields love to read and as you'll figure out pretty quickly on this tour Garfield was an egghead at his finest so we know that he actually had turned it into a library at one point and then when he is running for president, he converts it again into the presidential campaign office. It would have not one, but two telegraph lines going into it and multiple desks. And he had people working around the clock to keep him updated about what was going on around the country in regards to Garfield's campaign. Uh, it's in there that he receives the news that New York will have voted for him and he has won New York's electoral votes, which secures him the election pretty darn exciting. I mean, that's an electric place to be, really, right at the heart of a presidential campaign. Now, we're going to continue going this way here, and I want to get us up to that front porch, so it's a pretty exciting time. Now, why does Garfield buy this home so close to kind of his presidential run? There's two main reasons. Number one, he had four boys, and he wanted to teach them how to become farmers. It was kind of considered that didn't want to keep your boys in just the being townsfolk most of the time and the reason why is because farmers made good people in Garfield's mind they were strong they worked with dirt farming is the quintessential American profession at this time. now in addition he had a more political and practical reason he also wanted this home namely that he wanted to preserve his job in Congress when he bought this home he'd been serving as a congressman for 14 years He'd ultimately serve a little under 18 years there as a congressman. And he had received notice that the political lines for the 19th Congressional District, which we're seated in right now, was about to change. So where he lived in Hiram, about 40 minutes south of here, he was told that he would no longer be in his district. Well, Garfield would bellyache quite often about being a congressman, but he enjoyed the job at its fundamental core. And so consequently, he bought this home here in Mentor. Uh, this is where he would remain until he obviously ran successfully for president and moved into the White House. Different languages. And so it's in here that the Garfield family spent a lot of their time kind of commemorating their father. Uh, we like to say this is the first presidential library. After all, it's kind of a weird tradition in the United States that instead of building statues and monuments to our fallen executive leaders, instead we build libraries. Because Garfield was such an egghead and loved reading, Lucretia essentially compiled many of the most, you know, remarkable things in this hall and placed them in here in this library along with many other. In fact, Harry Garfield and Molly Garfield both were married in this bay window in a double wedding ceremony. And that would happen in 1888, about three years after this was completed. And you can just see that this must have been a spot that they really enjoyed spending time together, discussing these things, and the youngest son, Abram Garfield, was nine years old when his father passed away. 
I don't know about you, I don't have a lot of memories from nine years old. And so this was a place for him to really come back and kind of get a sense of his father and who he was. Powers, he was actually, it was part of a contest after Garfield had passed away, and that was the winning submission. It was considered so lifelike to Mr. Garfield that when it was shown to Eliza, his mother, she burst into tears. I writings on just about everything Garfield had ever scratched a pen to, love letters, diary entries, Civil War letters, agricultural notes, sermons, or as today they're all in the Library of Congress and you can see them for free. But in Garfield's time, or right after Garfield's time, the preacher compiles them all to this room. You'll also notice that the walls are gray, they're made of concrete, they're multiple feet thick. In the event of a fire, remember that this house is gas lit, she needed to have a way that she could ensure all these things were preserved and that if the house burned down, it would be saved. Uh, there's three different sets of doors which guard this room, just to give you a sense of how well she wanted to have the stuff preserved. And in there, everybody saw the beautiful wreath. If you haven't already, I encourage you to go on in. Well, that's all the video I got. So here are some still pictures of some of the rooms in the house. I hope you enjoyed the video. Please give me a thumbs up, subscribe, comment, share, and stay crafty when visiting President Garfield's home and museum. Thanks for watching.